All right, everybody. It says I'm live. Please let me know if you can hear and see me. Otherwise, thanks for being here once again on a Monday night. Hopefully, this is a better way to start the week than what you probably already experienced at work today. Um, but, you know, this is where we can get together, go over things that are relevant to preparedness, and talk about some of the things that are happening right this second that we should be aware of, especially in the sense of all of this nuclear tension in the world. So, looks like we've got Sherman Sales says 556 by 45. Axeman says hello. Janet LeBlanc says hello from Maine. We've got Mr. Landfill 5x5. Five five. And I want to mention, good to see everyone here on the replay because I appreciate you coming back and checking things out and trying to get some information. So, good evening, Dave Sickles. Good to see you as well. Uh, now, we have quite a bit to talk about, but the goal of tonight's chat is to talk about these nuclear drills that are happening right now, and of course how we shouldn't be concerned about them because there's never a reason to be concerned about them, right? <laughs> and then we also need to talk about some of the civilian targets that are becoming more and more apparently targets as time goes on with this conflict over in Eastern Europe because there's a lot of revelations coming out of that theater that can kind of show us what to expect in the future if we ever find ourselves in a similar situation or if there ever was any foreign aggression towards us here at uh, on the mainland of the USA, uh, how they might approach that aggression, right? Because there's a lot of different things happening uh, regarding nuclear power plants, right? And nuclear uh, tension in general, because we all know that Russia at any point in time could literally flip the switch. So let's get things going. Um, House of Lamar says Supreme Court just accepted a case regarding the ATF. There's a lot of activity in that realm as well. Unfortunately, at, at least in my opinion anyway, a lot of these court cases just seem to take a very long time. So usually time is not on our side, but in the end it usually works itself out because, well, the Constitution is just that, the Constitution. So, uh, but you know, our system likes to drag its feet a little bit. Let's get started on some of the interesting things that are going on right now. So first we're going to just start with something that's happening overseas, but then we're going to move right into domestic issues here in the USA at home to give you an idea of whether or not you could be a possible target moving forward. Because um, based on the information that I'm sharing tonight, and based on the information that's coming out very recently here, uh, there's reason to believe that a lot of targets in our area might not be the traditional ones we've all thought about when it comes to a nuclear crisis. So we have the U.S. revealing a joint nuclear disablement drill with South Korea. Okay, now this is actually kind of a big deal because um, this is the first time that the United States has actually disclosed a joint nuclear disablement exercise between us and South Korea. So there's a lot to kind of consider there when it comes to why this is being broadcast, right? Like, why are they telegraphing this drill now when they haven't in the past? And of course, a lot of it's probably based on deterrence and North Korea's recent actions. But either way, this should kind of tell you where we're at in the sense of the state of the world and how some of these nuclear drills are happening right now. This is from April 29th, okay? The U.S. Department of Defense has revealed that highly specialized nuclear teams from the United States and South Korea conducted joint drills in March to strengthen their interoperability on the Korean Peninsula. The Defense Visual Information Distribution Service, a Pentagon media service, released the report Wednesday when President Yoon suk Yeol held a summit with U.S. President Joe Biden in Washington. The leaders adopted the Washington Declaration to strengthen extended deterrence against North Korea's nuclear and missile threats and to establish a nuclear consultative group to discuss nuclear and strategic planning. And there's no hidden agenda here we're literally concerned about the idea that nuclear war could happen at any minute so everybody's ramping up their ability to respond to a nuclear incident and it's kind of interesting because back in the cold war era and back in prior nuclear tense environments right there was a lot more of a deterrence measure being taken right there's a lot more of a let's just say uh, defense through strength or defense through a good offense, right? Um, but now we're just kind of seeing everyone starting to practice for the aftermath of something rather than doing their best to prevent it from happening in the first place, which should kind of tell you where we're at and how our current... Let, I'll just use the word leadership lightly, but that's what we're using <laughs> for that word, um, and how they're approaching these scenarios. It very much seems like we're just waiting for it to happen rather than stopping it from happening, right? But who knows? Either way, I'm not, you know, an expert in those departments. All I know is that I read this information, digest it, and then I interpret it in the way that makes sense to me. So, either way. Okay, 
The NDTs and NCTs were able to plan and execute missions together and work hand in hand in areas that allow us to communicate effectively between each other and our soldiers downrange. Major Ariel A. Alcade, the deputy team leader for NDT3, was quoted as saying, this is a giant leap from the previous partnership events. So at least the bare minimum, this would give me an indicator that the nuclear threat coming from North Korea is becoming more and more of a reality and becoming more of a probability rather than a possibility, right? They have shown their strength over the last couple of years doing an unprecedented amount of ICBM tests as well as other missile tests and have shown that they don't really care about their missiles entering sovereign territory like Japan, right? So there's a lot of things moving in that direction over there and these drills are happening now in South Korea to get them ready for that possible event. So that should just tell you where we're at in the sense of aggression in the Asian theater, let's just call it, all right? <laughs> all right, and not the theater where you watch The Emperor Has No Clothes. Where's No Clothes? I don't remember. I, I'm not a theater major, but as you guys can probably tell by some of the acting I've done in my videos where I try to portray a certain type of character and maybe it falls flat on its face, but here's what's happening domestically, and this is what we really need to be aware of, and this is why I said earlier in the chat that I believe it was um, Christian would be, uh, you know, very happy about the way that this is going to go, because the very first drill that's going on right now that we're going to discuss here in America is literally the FBI saying, don't be alarmed. <laughs> and uh, I believe Christian's statement was, uh, you know, don't forget the feds will tell you there's nothing to worry about, right? So... FBI, don't be alarmed by upcoming nuclear training event incident exercise in Houston, okay? So this is happening today through May 5th. So maybe you're in the Houston area, maybe you've seen increased activity. If that's the case, let us know in the chat or in the comments just to kind of give everybody an idea as what it looks like. Because at the bare minimum, you might at least be having somewhat of a front row seat to an example of what to expect if there was a nuclear incident, right? So you could kind of see what the response would look like, what kind of activity there would be, both in the air and on the ground. Um, and it just kind of gives you a little bit more insight than somebody would have otherwise. So I find that to be relatively valuable. But the FBI Houston says they'll be conducting a large-scale training exercise in Southeast Houston and Harris County Monday, May 1st through M Friday, May 5th. All right? And of course, they say don't be alarmed. It's just an exercise. There's no reason to be alarmed, but... Although, you know, we just announced the first ever joint cooperative nuclear exercise with South Korea. Um, for the first time, we disclosed it anyway. Uh, so now uh, we're also doing this in Houston. But there's nothing to worry about uh, because nothing is really imperative or going to happen. We just do these things because they're routine. And we've heard a lot of that over the last couple of years. Well, these things are routine. These things happen all the time, right? But if you do some research and you study up on kind of the the usual routines that are done in the past, you'll see that timelines have been moved up or changed around and there's some differences compared to how they'd usually been done before. So these are just things to keep in mind moving forward. But this is happening in Houston, Texas right now, okay? If you notice what looks or sounds like a large scale emergency response in Southeast Houston and Harris County, don't be alarmed. That's the message from the FBI's Houston office. The agency tweeted that a large-scale multi-agency nuclear training exercise will happen Monday, May 1st through Friday, May 5th. The FBI says the training exercise won't pose a risk to people in the area, okay? Understand that, yes, we've always kind of... Well, maybe we're on the fringe of certain ideas or information, right? But in general... Uh, in the past, a lot of th times something big has happened. It's also been in conjunction with the drill. So we always keep our eye on these types of things just in case, right? But at the same time, it should just tell you where we are as a country that we're preparing for these types of things. Now, the difference that I want to mention before we move forward with this article and discussion is that here in the United States compared to other countries right now, we... Like, we're doing these drills. We're trying to prepare for this situation. But we're also not getting our people ready to the same degree that almost every other country in Europe as well as in the Asian Pacific is getting their people ready at this point in time. I mean, and, and of course, you know, like Taiwan has like an imminent threat situation going on right now, right? But in Taiwan, they're doing drills on a regular basis where you have people on the streets suddenly being told to take shelter. They're running to the nearest parking garage, going to the lowest level, hiding under things that are considered to be, you know, strong enough to withstand whatever kind of, you know, blast there might be or whatever. And here in the United States, there's literally none of that happening, right? So this should just kind of tell you where we're at and maybe some of the, the, the bravado that we still kind of maintain that might not be as uh, warranted as it used to be in the past. Now, 
One thing I will say, and this is just from my personal information, there are some still in existence that are still operational, but I live in Minuteman Missile Silo Territory, and in my immediate area, there are no functional fallout shelters that I'm aware of. And if there are buildings that housed fallout shelters in the past, those shelters have been allocated to basement storage, basically, and are not being upkept and don't have any of the necessary supplies or anything ready for being used as a fallout shelter. So... Basically, we're on our own here in the United States, whereas countries like Japan are building bunkers. We have, you know, Finland has been building bunkers and prepping for this kind of stuff for ever since the end of, you know, World War II. And here we are in the United States, like, with really no support in that realm. And even when I've talked to emergency management managers in my area uh, and I ask about fallout shelters, there's always this kind of questioning tone in their voice of, oh, what do you mean? Or, oh, uh, well, you know, I... We're not really sure I'll have to get back on you on that one and it's it's sort of concerning especially based on like where I'm located so just keep all that in mind but these exercises are happening this stuff is becoming more, Tonight, more prevalent the power of technology oh we hold on we got someone trying to fight me now when it comes to uh, the audio between what's but, real and what's fake um, this is where we're at. And Zach Caltari spoke with someone in the everybody. Katy so, area who says his uh, which parents got scammed involved by a is actually, fake voice. Um, important to warn as well. others we to listen to the story so they don't fall prey. Department of Defense, 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 Department of Energy, the National Nuclear Security Administration, the FBI, and Department of Homeland Security, as for local agencies, the Harris County Sheriff's Office, and Houston Police Department, as well as the Fire, Health, and Emergency Management Agencies, will be part of the exercise. Because of the sensitive nature, the FBI said the public is not allowed to observe the training. Which is interesting because and can you it's a really big out. part of Houston that they're doing this training. The other end of the phone, uh, let's see, I think in, at some point in, in this specifically. presentation, they show a map of Houston. Uh, let's see if I can pull it up here. Let's see. Nope, no, we already passed on to a different story. It's fine. Either way, it's taken up quite a bit of territory in that area. Now, let me see if I can kind of pin down where some of this uh, audio is coming from because, you know, somebody has to be trying to take me over. Maybe it's just some uh, some kind of like trolling or a DNS type of tag. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think I'm that important, to be honest with you. But we'll just go ahead and mute everything for a second here. All right. And I guarantee you it's Fox News because they're always being loud and obnoxious. But it is what it is. Okay. So let's get back in the chat here for a second. Um, you guys still hear the background news. That's interesting. I think I fixed it. Did I not? Audio is caked. Everybody's talking about the audio. Um, Nick uh, Papa Giorgio. Awesome name, by the way. Yes, I will go ahead and get that going for you. And yeah, sorry about the whole the whole situation there. I mean, it was uh, it just came out of left field. And I, I had my audio on, so I heard it as soon as it started going. But it wasn't letting me get rid of it very easily. So um, yes, I will go ahead and link that map uh, because it is something that's relevant. And that way, um, there's also a list that we'll talk about that gives you all of those uh, locations shown in the thumbnail. Okay, so first off, one of the things I want everyone to keep in mind when it comes to this whole Texas situation is this scenario right here they're doing nuclear uh drills and trying to get ready for that kind of stuff right we all know that well here's the other thing that we need to keep in mind we think of nuclear drills as being related to a nuclear attack and in case you're new here i'm trying my best not to speak overly quickly tonight i tend to get a little bit hyped up maybe because of all the coffee i drink but i'm trying to make sure that the information is put out in an articulate way that everyone can understand without me speaking too quickly. So bear with me if it's a, a little of a different pace than usual, but I'm trying my best here to accommodate, right? Okay, so in Houston, or about 90 miles southeast of Houston, um, or southwest, I actually believe. Yes, yes, southwest, okay. Um, we actually have a nuclear power plant. And we're going to talk about why that's relevant here in a minute, okay? The state of nuclear energy in Texas. Okay, this talks about nuclear energy being used in Texas, but here's the part that matter. There are two operating nuclear power plants in Texas. The South Texas Project, STP, is in Matagorda County near Bay City, about 90 miles southwest of Houston. Comanche Park Nuclear Power Plant is in Somervale County near Glen Rose, Texas, about 40 miles south of Fort Worth. Okay, now understand that... There's a lot of evidence that these nuclear power plants are problematic during conflict, especially now that we've witnessed what's going on in Eastern Europe. 
And at the same time, uh, with these drills taking place in such close proximity to that power plant, you should kind of consider the idea that not every nuclear crisis is related to a nuclear weapon, right? And a lot of the thought process there comes down to, okay, nuclear strikes are going to target missile silos, military bases, possibly major population centers. But the thing we're not considering a lot of times is, what about nuclear power plants, right? And it's not necessarily that they're going to target nuclear power plants with nuclear missiles. The idea is that during a conflict scenario, whether or not it's foreign or domestic, right, um, these power plants become extremely valuable. They become strategic assets, and they also seem to be prone to possible attacks. And I'm going to talk about that evidence and, and some of that information here in just a minute. But it's a consideration you need to make, especially because this nuclear plant is southwest of houston right and then prevailing winds tend to travel east i mean i guess things get a little bit weird down there in the gulf of mexico but either way um it's a good possibility that the fallout from such a situation would head towards houston and either way now you have a nuclear incident that you have to deal with from an emergency management standpoint, right? So it's not just about a nuclear weapon. And this is why things get really interesting. And just to kind of give everybody a visual here, the map showing where Bay City is, right? So we have Houston right here, okay, obviously. And I believe a lot of the training exercises are kind of like, here, let me kind of see if I can show you that. But they're kind of in this area right here. I don't think you can see my cursor, unfortunately. It's really thin or hard to see. But then Bay City, uh, where did you go, Bay City? I know I looked at you here earlier. It's down here, okay? So this is Bay City, and then we have Houston up here, right? And then the exercises are kind of in this region over here where you see, like, Alvin, basically, okay? Now, keep that in mind because I don't think that every one of these drills or incident events are particularly geared solely towards the use of a nuclear weapon or a nuclear detonation. And that's why we have to talk about all of these nuclear power plants around the country and how they become weaponized in many ways during some type of a conflict situation. And there's a lot of information coming out of Ukraine right now that actually proves that that's the case. All right, so here's a, the map that you guys were talking about that is on the thumbnail. This is from the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Map of power reactor sites, okay? And you can see all the different reactor sites here. And then there's a list of them as well. So first off, I'll go ahead and post this in the chat just so you guys have it in case you're curious, okay? And then on here, we actually have a list that gives you every operational nuclear plant in the United States right now to give you an idea of where you might want to look for some of these things, okay? So we'll go ahead and go to the list next. Let's see here. There we go. And then here's your list that gives you all of that information too. So I'll go ahead and put that in the chat as well right now, okay? And let's see here. List of power plants, right? So we have all over the place, of course. We have uh, Arkansas, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Alabama, North Carolina, Illinois, Missouri. We got Maryland, North Carolina, Illinois, Washington, Texas. We've got Nebraska, Michigan, right? So all of these different uh, places are just covered in, in nuclear power plants, okay? And any of these that you're within proximity to could possibly make you a target, but in a different way than just a straight up nuclear strike. I'm worried about a nuclear strike of some kind because of, of in a preemptive strike scenario, I've got, you know, Minuteman missiles within not very far from my house, just to be completely honest. It's not the most uh, reassuring feeling, but I don't have any nuclear power plants in my entire state. Uh, but I guess I don't really need them considering there's a ton of nuclear fuel all over the state under the ground, right? But if you're in one of these areas where you don't have to consider nuclear missile silos and you don't have to worry about military bases, what about these nuclear power plants, right? So, I mean, it's possible you're, I don't know, near Bloomington, Illinois, and you didn't realize within 23 miles of Bloomington, there is a nuclear power plant, okay? Now, let's go ahead and talk about why this is an issue, okay? And this is just what people are focused on right this second. Now, this is actually an article from September 9th of 2022, okay? For Russia, nuclear plants are nuclear bombs, right? Now, that's a little bit dramatic, let's be honest, you know? But the idea behind it is why I wanted to have this conversation tonight. Before we get too deep into that, I want to check back in the chat here. Uh, Exile Reviews, by the way, thank you for being here and modding tonight. I do appreciate it. 
And I will put those uh, links in the comments section below too. So if you're here on the replay, I will go ahead and make sure you have access to those as well. I think it's just good information to have because if you don't, or if you're not aware of your proximity to some of these power plants, you might not be aware of the fact that they could become weaponized at some point here in the future. Okay, uh, Small Town 1776. Thanks for being here, and uh, we'll see you on the on the back end. All right. Uh, so let's see. Da, da, da. Yeah, exactly. Granite State Prepper. Very comforting uh, headline indeed. Let's talk about it. So, for Russia, nuclear plants are nuclear bombs, okay? Uh, here we go. We're talking about Chernobyl, Ukraine, all that stuff. Okay. During the Cold War, Russian experts called nuclear power plants a nuclear bomb on enemy territory. Conventional weapons, when used to strike nuclear power plants, can have the properties of nuclear weapons and have a, great, a significantly greater impact on the environment. This led to the possibility of considering nuclear power plants and peaceful nuclear facilities as weapons of mass destruction and to consider a strike on them as a passive form of employing WMDs. The question of nuclear power plant vulnerability in an attack by a hostile state has not been widely considered because it was unofficially recognized that it was impossible to protect such facilities from a missile or airstrike. That is, it was recognized that it was irrational to conduct military engagements on a territory where there is a nuclear power plant. The benefits from the destruction of the nuclear facility as a strategic energy and economic facility were offset by direct and indirect collateral damage. Thus, the understanding grew that nuclear power plants are no less of a threat than nuclear weapons and according to some indicators are actually peaceful weapons of mutual nuclear deterrence. Yet, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the seizure of a nuclear power plant destroys this concept. The military is used both to capture and to hold the nuclear power plant. Uh, da, da, da. It, it, that was a terrible sentence. Ukraine's civil military facilities have become important military strategic locations for Russia. It has not needed to threaten the use of nuclear weapons. And since there, there is an order of magnitude more radiation inside a reactor than in a bomb, radiation pollution due to the explosion of a nuclear reactor would be far larger. Okay? Now, we know what's been going on with the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, right? We know that this whole thing is becoming more and more problematic and this is why i wanted to have this conversation because i don't think a lot of people here in the united states have considered that the nuclear power plants are foreseeably a target not just the fact that they're somewhat dangerous if they were to have a meltdown or have some kind of a fatal accident right because these things do just happen they're man-made machines in many ways and they can fail so yes of course being in proximity of a nuclear plant has its risks but i don't know if everyone's kind of put the two and two together of how much these could be used towards an enemy's goals in the sense of being weaponized, right? Dangerous targets, civilian nuclear infrastructure, and the war in Ukraine. Guess what? This article came out April 28th, 2023. So now we're catching up and people are starting to get a little bit more concerned about all of this. Now, Rusi is a research institute from the UK, okay? Because I wasn't really sure who they were either at first. I'm like, Rusi sounds like bias to me, right? <laughs> but I mean, it, of course, it still has bias, but this is from the UK, not from the country you might assume based on the, even the logo and everything else related to that. But okay. The war in Ukraine has underlined the need to enhance the safety and security of nuclear power plants in war zones. Okay. Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. And everyone has to rehash that every single article, I swear. Over the past year, Russia's military activity in Ukraine has resulted in serious threats to safety and security of Ukraine's nuclear infrastructure, and there's good reason to believe that Russia has violated the protections granted to NPPs, or nuclear power plants, in international humanitarian law. Given the significant projected global increase in the number of nuclear reactors over the coming decades, it is likely that this will not be the last time NPPs are in the midst of a military conflict. This report seeks to assess the risks the ongoing war poses to NPPs in Ukraine and to draw preliminary conclusions from these events to improve the safety and security of NPPs in conflict. Okay. There's a lot of focus being put on nuclear power plants right now, especially like the previous article told us, these nuclear power plants have far more radioactive fuel than a nuclear warhead tends to have, which means that the environmental implications that one can produce if it were to have a catastrophic failure and enter the mode of meltdown uh, is worse than what a nuclear bomb might even produce. So these places are being weaponized and they're being used as shields as well as offensive tools and to assume they're not being targeted 
is at this point naive, especially knowing what we know now about Zaporizhia and everything else that was going on with Chernobyl at the beginning of the conflict. We know that these places are going to be used one way or the other and that in the wrong hands can be turned into a seriously catastrophic scenario. This is why I wanted to bring this up to everybody, okay? The greatest threat to Ukraine's NPPs is unlikely to be from a direct strike on a reactor and an ensuing large-scale radiological incident similar to the 1986 Chernobyl disaster, but rather the failure of key systems, namely water and energy supply, or human error, potentially resulting in an incident not unlike what occurred at Fukushima NPP in 2011. Okay, so the threat of a direct strike is more of a concern when it comes to the pool type spent nuclear fuel storage or the sarcophagus containing the remnants of the destroyed Unit 4 at the CHNPP, which are not designed to be as robust as the containment structures over the operating reactors. There's also a risk that Ukraine may run out of available storage for its used nuclear fuel as it cannot currently transport spent fuel safely. Finally, the possibility that Russia may manufacture a radiological incident at the ZNPP, that's the Zaporizhia, or another facility to spoil a Ukrainian offensive should not be disregarded. A Ukrainian offensive, what, like the one that's supposed to be happening right now? A counteroffensive, you might say? So, yes, there is a lot of concern that these power plants will be used as a way to deter such an offensive or be a consequence of an offensive, right? So... Here's how they want to improve nuclear safety and mitigate risks. And now I think this is important to kind of pay attention to because it lets you just know how much of a risk this has uh, involved. And it lets you know what other governments around the world, as well as our own, are probably trying to accomplish in the sense of hardening these targets. Okay, To improve nuclear safety and security in Ukraine, the international community should ensure the personal safety and welfare of staff at MPPs. Ensure sufficient licensed Ukrainian staff are ready to resume operations at the ZNPP following Russian withdrawal from the facility. Good luck, I guess, right? Facilitate the safe transport of spent nuclear fuel to dry storage facilities where appropriate. And that makes sense. I mean, if they're actually running out of space for this spent fuel... It's very dangerous to transport it in that region right now, so what else are they supposed to do, right? Assess availability of highly radioactive waste storage facilities and certify additional storage if needed. Provide chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear emergency response and other necessary equipment, training, and support to the Ukrainian military, which we're already doing, by the way, and we'll talk about that here in just a minute. Uh, provide regular updates on the supply of fuel for emergency generators. Ensure the safe supply of diesel fuel, maintenance parts and services. Penalize Ro Ro Rosatom staff operating... That's not good. Okay, that sounds good, but it's not going to happen. Establish deterrence against a deliberately manufactured radiological incident by making clear to Russia that any such incident would be followed by a massive response. Also not going to matter. So that those last two parts are just them saying things because they want to let you know that they should be punished for all of this. Okay, but... Okay. To mitigate against potential threats to nuclear safety and security in future conflicts, the international community should consider and adopt the necessary prevention and mitigation measures for a state-level military conflict and occupation of nuclear facilities by an invading force as part of national threat assessments, design basis threats, and wider national defense and security planning. So, with that being said, you have to understand that if we're doing these drills and we're doing these exercises to make sure that we can respond properly to a nuclear incident, and then these are the bullet points coming out of these research facilities saying, hey, in order to ensure nuclear safety during a conflict in the future, these are the things that we should try to do. You have to try start connecting the dots and say, okay, it sounds to me like there's a, a real risk here at these power plants and that these are going to be weaponized and that we're actually moving towards trying to find out ways to mitigate that risk, right? Include considerations on military attack and occupation of nuclear facilities in the International Atomic Energy Agency's nuclear safety and security standards. Hard and physical protections in the design of new NPPs, aka make new nuclear power plants very strong against attack and harden existing power plants, right? So, to ensure the safety and security in areas of active operations, you should establish a one kilometer demilitarized zone. Good luck if you're the, the people they're trying to get rid of, right? Grant special protected status to MPP safety. That's only if people listen to those things. Define an obligation for the establishment of deconfliction lines by militaries operating around MPPs. Okay, if they feel obligated. And establish regulations relating to the effects of cyber and electromagnetic activities applied to the vicinity of MPPs, okay? Uh, understand that all those things would have to have everyone agree to abide by those. And 
that's not how war is going to work anymore. And as we're seeing right now from Russia and we're seeing from countries like China, I don't think that they care about things like the Geneva Convention. Like, I don't think they care about the United Nations, you know, opinion on how they're handling their operations. Like at this point in time, there's really nothing in it for them to comply with any of these guidances or rules or anything else that's in those different dictates because why would it matter they're at war and at war you do what you got to do to to do what's best for you i guess is the best way to say it and as preppers because I, I would assume the majority of us here are right if you're into preparedness and you consider the possibility of dealing with some of these things in the future you know you maybe you're in eastern europe and you're worried about the ukrainian conflict spreading or something like that well understand that although these these laws are in place for militaries around the world as a personal just individual right as a civilian like you don't have to pay attention to that stuff and i'm sorry but that's just the truth right like for example there's certain limitations on if militaries can use things like hollow points right which sounds crazy but that's just some of the different conventional agreements that have been made over the years right well as a prepared individual if i have to deal with a threat and it's something that i don't have any other choice in order to take care of it well you better believe hollow points or something along those lines are probably going to be utilized more so than anything else right so like these are the things to consider and i'm just throwing that kind of an example out there to let you know that once those things don't matter everything's off the table and according to at least my opinion of what russia and china have been up to lately it's very unlikely that they're going to follow every rule and guideline set by the west during a wartime scenario between them and the west right to assume that those guidelines and regulations are going to be abided by is just kind of ridiculous at this point. That's just my opinion. The same reason why everyone's ditching the dollar, right? They, they don't care what we think or want to do anymore. It's not that they, it's not on their agenda. So if we say, hey, you can't do that, that, do you think they care? Of course not. So nuclear power plants are definitely on the table. Like they're not going to ever be looked at as like, oh, we can't touch that. You know, it is a nuclear power. It's got a one kilometer de demilitarized zone. So we can't don't listen to those things and assume that that's going to protect the situation near you just because someone on a piece of paper said at one point in time that you can't do that, right? Um, that's just the way it works, okay? Now, uh, hey, I'm just looking in the uh, chat here just for a second. Uh, Morris Venture Channel loves rustic camping. Can't go wrong with that. Uh, let's see. Kevin Grip, whole attitude on nuke plants changed overnight. Yeah, well, and that's just kind of the way it is. And uh, unfortunately, um, in my opinion, I mean it's probably easier to pull off some kind of a catastrophic failure style attack on a nuclear power plant than it would to actually pull off a nuclear strike. Not to mention the amount of flexibility it gives a, a, a an adversary to say, hey, you know, like we didn't use a nuclear weapon and we didn't actually mean to target that plant. Missile flew off course, can't believe it happened, but it did. So, uh, but you know, a, a retaliatory nuclear strike is really not necessary for, for, for such a conventional weapon use, right? So there's a lot of things to consider when it comes to why that might be advantageous to somebody who wants to do harm to another country that has nuclear power, okay? So let's go ahead and talk about how they are militarizing these nuclear plants now and how they're making them more hardened. And you know why we're saying that we should probably start doing that? Because that's what Russia is doing, right? Ukraine situation report. Russia beefed up defenses at Zaporizhia nuke plant. Okay, and this is from April 27th. Like I said, this is all relevant new information. Like this is not just hearsay and discussions from 10 years ago about what could possibly happen like this this is happening right now real time based on this other conflict that's going on that we need to learn from while we can because i don't know about you but i mean i used to live very close to a nuclear power plant and knowing that there's a possibility it could be targeted as a strategic asset should concern you based on the fact that things are happening uh along those lines right now okay the fortifications were likely installed due to Russia's concerns over an offensive that could run through the plant, okay? So they're hardening the plant because they know this counteroffensive might be coming to try to take it uh, back over. And what is that going to look like? And listen, don't forget, there's always the possibility of sabotage if they are going to have to pull out, right? Because nobody wants to just leave peacefully in the middle of a conflict. So all right, if you want it, you can have it, but it's on fire. Have a good time, right? So these are all things to consider as well. Um, you know, self-destruct is a real thing when it comes to uh, giving up assets, right? Not to mention the fact that 
We also know how, you know, squatters tw treat people's houses when they have to leave and get evicted. They usually destroy the place on their way out because they're mad, right? And so just keep all that in mind. Ahead of the looming Ukrainian counteroffensive that could very well drive through the occupied portions of Zaporizhia Oblast, the Russians have been reinforcing their military presence at Europe's largest nuclear power plant, according to British military intelligence, okay? James Bond said so, so you know it's true. While that assessment downplays concerns about a radioactive catastrophe at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant as a result of any fighting on the premises, combat there in March 2022 sparked global concerns that such an event could take place, okay? Now, imagery shows... That by March 2023, Russian forces had established sandbag fighting positions on the roofs of several buildings at Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. The UK's Defense Intelligence Directorate said Thursday in a tweet. Russia captured the plant in March 2022, but this is the first indication of the actual reactor buildings being integrated into tactical defense planning. Russia has likely constructed these because it is increasingly concerned about the prospects of a major Ukrainian offensive. All right, So you have hardened positions being put into place on top of buildings that are connected to this nuclear power plant. And that should tell you exactly what you might expect if you were to ever see something like this in your area. And look, people in this chat, yes, you're, a lot of you are from the United States, but there are people here from you know Canada, but also from the UK, and also from places like Norway and Switzerland. There's a lot of people here that are from different countries that are a much closer to this situation that might have more of a possibility of seeing this than even we do here in the States. But we shouldn't underestimate the possibility of this happening here either. Underestimating your enemy is the biggest mistake you can make. And I see a lot of that here in the preparedness community just because, you know, America, which I'm very America in that way. But I also have to be reasonable about the fact that underestimating my enemy is a bad idea. Now, the move highly likely increases the chances of damage to ZNPP safety systems if fighting takes place around ZNPP. However, direct catastrophic damage to the reactors is unlikely under most plausible scenarios involving infantry weapons because the structures are very heavily reinforced. Infantry weapons. <laughs> They're not saying, you know, artillery, right? They're not saying missile strikes. They're just talking about infantry. But at least... In my understanding, and now, you know, I have never served in the military, so I don't have any kind of military background or anything like that. But what I will say is that my understanding is that if you're in a defensive position and you begin to get overrun, a lot of times the best thing to do is call for air support, right? Or radio in. Like, hey, we need help. And uh, usually things fall from the sky. Whether or not that's drones, aircraft, or even artillery that's far away, right? So just keep all that in mind because... But there's a lot of ways this thing can go wrong. And although we discussed that in the Texas discussion earlier, how the FBI said nothing to be alarmed of, nothing to worry about, right? Well, even the UK Defense Ministry is saying, you know, this is unlikely. And there's no real chance or plausible scenario where a nuclear reactor gets damaged, right? Which is an incredibly bold thing to say when you're in a hot kinetic war and the Nuclear power plant itself is getting sandbag fortifications built on the roof of multiple buildings that are part of the plant, and they are hardening the defenses in anticipation of a counteroffensive. And to assume that even with all that happening, the likelihood is very low, I think that's very optimistic, okay? Um, which is why we should just pay attention. All right, now, there's more going on in that region as well. I will say, first and foremost, or... 38 minutes later and foremost, <laughs> uh, biggest supporter of the channel is Midway USA. And I mention them in every video and that's the, the reason that we work together is because, hey, you know what? Uh, they're helping me do what I got to do here to be more prepared and I appreciate what they do to allow me to get more of this information out there and to try out more gear and stuff like that. So I appreciate them very much as a company for taking care of me and for being pro Second Amendment and doing what they can to kind of keep that whole thing going because... The more companies we have that are involved with that, the better, because things are getting really tight in that department, unfortunately, okay? Now, let's talk about why, what else the U.S. is doing in that region, okay? Oh my gosh, now, of course, I uh, uh, already lost my read this article privileges from the Japan Times, but we'll be okay. We're going to get through it together because we don't need the whole article, I guess. <laughs> All right. U.S. wires Ukraine with radiation sensors to detect nuclear blasts, okay? Now, this just kind of shows you how things are developing. But a big thing that's being broadcast here or telegraphed is, 
all right, we're wiring Ukraine with these nuclear or these radiation sensors because we're concerned about Russia using a tactical nuclear weapon at some point in the future here, right? That, there's a lot of talk about that right now. Tactical nuclear weapon, tactical nuclear weapon. Because it's not, you know, a strategic nuclear weapon. So it's not, you know, the big one. But it's also, you know, not going to take out an entire city, but it's still radioactive. So there's a lot of discussion there, but not as much about, well, what if this nuclear plant goes up, right? So I think there's a lot of dots to be connected in this conversation that the media doesn't seem to want to connect for you but once you start reading through all of it and kind of considering all the different factors in your head you can see how all of this relates to the possibility of these power plants being used as weapons i mean i don't know what else to say about it and you saw the map earlier like i said i'll share it in the comments below in case you missed it in the live chat but make sure if you're close to one that you have good cbrn plans because you know, it doesn't have to be a nuclear bomb. And people say, oh, if nukes go off, why do you want to be alive anyway? Hopefully I get vaporized right in the beginning, right? Well, you're not going to get vaporized if a nuclear power plant melts down. That's just not how it works. But you might die two weeks later in a horrible fashion if you didn't take any precautions at all, right? So this is why I'm trying to bring this up because these plants are being targeted now in this conflict, which means that if there's ever anything like that happening here, they're going to be targeted. And there's reason to believe that more stuff is happening here, which we'll talk about here in a second. So, the United States is wiring Ukraine with sensors that can detect bursts of radiation from a nuclear weapon or a dirty bomb and can confirm the identity of the attacker. In part, the goal is to make sure that if Russia detonates a radioactive weapon on Ukrainian soil, its atomic signature and Moscow's culpability would be verified. Ever since Russia invaded Ukraine, da, da, da. see, they always go back to that. Like It's always like, here's a whole paragraph about last year. We know, we know now. You don't have to remind us every time. Um, but basically, they're wiring Ukraine for the ability to sense these nuclear events, okay? So in my opinion, that just shows how much closer we are to that type of, of an event. Um, and unfortunately, we, we live in a very multifaceted world when it comes to the generation of warfare we're currently in, right? So understand that I will never downplay the idea that a rogue entity could easily do something at this point in time, which would then escalate this war into a very dangerous territory. And for some people, I mean, let's go back, let's let's Hollywood it a little bit, right? The Dark Knight, the Joker basically said some people just want to see the world burn, right? And and that's true. I mean, there are people like that who would love to just see a, a reset. And I, and I don't mean the great reset where you'll own nothing and be happy, but I mean like a full-on catastrophic reset where no one has a choice in the matter right? And there are people out there who would like to see that happen. So I am concerned about those types of people interacting in a way that would be escalatory, let's just say, okay? It can happen. Now, um, Bail Shar, Bail Shar says, Adam Bomb Baby, don't come around. <laughs> I do, uh, I do appreciate the, uh, the reference there. Now, uh, we also have some interesting things happening here stateside as well. And one thing that just came out today, which is just a reminder, okay? Another balloon was being tracked. I found this to be interesting, okay? U.S. Defense Department tracking another balloon traveling between Hawaii and Mexico. Published today, okay? The U.S. Department of Defense is tracking another high-altitude balloon that crossed over Hawaii and is heading toward Mexico. The DOD and Federal Aviation Administration detected and tracked an unmanned balloon off the coast of Hawaii on April 28th, which was floating at about 36,000 feet. Now, there's some big inconsistencies here that I want you to really consider. Because compared to what we were told last time all this balloon fiasco stuff was happening, now the tone has changed dramatically, and I'm very unsure as to why, but I am concerned about the capability of these balloons and what they're able to do, okay? So, the ownership of the balloon is unknown, and according to the spokesman, there was no indication whether it was being maneuvered or controlled by a foreign or adversarial actor. Sounds like you don't have any information at all, yet now we're releasing it to the public. Why is that? We always have to ask these questions because... Things just don't make sense a lot of the times, right? When the balloon crossed in a U.S. airspace over Hawaii, okay, this is the part you should pay attention to, it did not float over critical infrastructure used for defense or any other U.S. government-sensitive sites, the spokesman said, nor did it pose a threat to the military or people on the ground. Okay, but it's still in our airspace. Although it was flying at an altitude used by civil aviation, it posed no threat to civil aviation over Hawaii. Now, I don't understand how you can draw that conclusion. 
Although it was in the civil aviation altitude, it didn't pose a threat to any civil aviation. Because I guess if the airplanes just don't hit it, they'll be fine, right? Based on these observations, the Secretary of Defense concurred with the recommendation of his military commanders that no action need to be taken against the balloon. Now, look, this whole balloon fiasco was a big deal when all that first started happening, right? It was a huge deal. Everyone was freaking out about it. I mean, and it made sense. We're shooting down things over American airspace. Like, that is insane. We, we should remember that as being a very s dramatic situation, right? That's not something that happens here on a regular basis. But this balloon was over American airspace in the civilian airspace um, altitude, which before, before, when we were told why they didn't shoot down the balloons, it's because, well, they were traveling at an altitude that didn't have any inherent danger to civil air traffic. And now this one is in the civil airspace, and somehow it's also not a danger. And it's directly over Hawaii, but that's somehow not an issue. Like, there's a lot of inconsistencies here with this story that make me question what's really happening here. And the other thing I want you to keep in mind is that here we're going to go to Fox News, okay? And, and look, I'm not a huge, like, Fox News guy per se. There's a lot of things that I have a lot of critiques for them. If you wanted to hear them one day, we can, we can talk about it, okay? But here's something I want you to, to understand. Remember how crazy the balloon scenario was, okay? Remember how insane it was, okay? Watch this, okay? With all this stuff, all this stuff, all this stuff. Hold on. Oh, there, there's the balloon. There's the balloon story, okay? I mean, this came out today. It came out today. And this story is that far down on the front page. That should tell you that there's something weird here, okay? I don't know what it is, I'm not trying to say I know what it is. I'm just letting you know that I don't like, I don't like it. There's something odd going on, all right? Now, Ghostling Con says ice cream and balloons. I know, it's just like the circus. It's almost like we live in one. I'm not sure how or why I would come to that conclusion. Uh, let's see here. Um, does the balloon say Trojan on the side? <laughs> no, no, the balloon was not in the shape of a horse or I'm not aware of it, but you know what? I have a feeling that would be the biggest troll ever and it would still make sense and we'd probably still want to shoot it down um let's see rebecca snavely says you bring up some good points well i i try my best right and i'll always give you guys this dis disclosure every week when we get together just remember i am just some guy okay i'm not an expert on military tactics or you know nuclear power plants or balloons right i'm just i'm not but i at least have a generalized understanding of how to read and I feel like I have a decent way of taking information and then putting it out there in a way that's digestible. That's the best way I can describe it, okay? And uh, I'm hoping that, um, that you guys get some value out of these conversations because I look at this information and I find it relevant, so that's why I share it. If I don't find it relevant, then I don't share it. And there are things that are relevant that I'm not sharing because I just don't have time to share every single piece of relevant information. But either way, I appreciate that. I really do. Now... Viv B, yeah, just some guy, you know what I mean? So, what else is happening here stateside? Well, this has, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be completely honest here. This has nothing to do with nuclear power plants. But it is something I want everyone to be aware of. First Republic Bank failed, and J.P. Morgan bought it, right? And J.P. Morgan bought a failed bank that customers had withdrawn $100 billion from, and somehow they're going to save it, okay? We're in trouble. That's all there is to it. I don't know what else to say here. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not going to dive into this, uh, you know, deep dive mode right now. I put out that video over the weekend about the uh, correlations between some of the events during the Great Depression, uh, Depression, the Great Depression regarding bank failures and how the timeline is similarly adding up to what we're dealing with right now. Um, but I don't want to go into all the nitty gritty details of all these financial numbers, basically, right? Because they don't really matter. The thing that you should pay attention to isn't the fact that JP Morgan bought that bank out. The thing you should be paying attention to is that another bank failed. And it was about a month after all the other bank failures were happening. And that timeline lines up so neatly with what happened during the Great Depression that I think, you know, within the next couple of years, we're going to look back and say, well, we knew this was going to happen, right? Uh, and that's if we don't get out of this first. Now, how do you get out of it? Unfortunately, um, 
one of the only ways out of our current situation is probably through conflict. Because the people we owe the most money to are also the people that we're telling no on a regular basis. And I think at a certain point, uh, they're going to say, well, I mean, pay us back then, right? And that's when, uh, that's when all the debt we've taken on in order to fund the military power that we've had for this time will hopefully pay off, right? Especially because if you go bankrupt, um, but the people that you're going bankrupt to no longer exist, then maybe you don't have to pay it back. I don't know. So, Chris Hollingsworth, Whiskey Alpha Romeo. Yeah, and that's unfortunate because um, that's the last thing I want. Look, here's the thing. I don't want any of these things. Um, <laughs> Daryl Calhoun, the Vatican, J.P. Morgan Chase. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, there's some weird things there. Don't get me wrong. But I don't want any of this stuff to happen. Like, I've got, I got kids. You know, I've got a young family that I want to grow and enjoy their life and, and prosper and uh, you know, go on to be adults and, and live their lives well too and comfortably. You know, I, I was very privileged to have a very comfortable life. You know, I mean, I wasn't rich, but like my family took care of me, right? And um, and and I, that's that's what I'm trying to do for them as well. And unfortunately, um, the current state of the world just has me, you know, concerned about that that future. And I don't want them to suffer, and I don't want them to experience anything like that. But I also have to be realistic about the fact that, like, you know, we're we're, we're likely going to experience it at some point here. And that's why I prep. So that way, all the prepping I do now hopefully pays off for them to be more comfortable during this situation, okay? The more comfortable they can be, the less I have to watch them suffer, right? Right? And obviously, I hope there isn't any suffering at all. You know, um, would catastrophic nuclear war probably be good for this channel? Probably, right? I, let's just be honest, right? Like, if everybody's being affected by something like that, people are going to be like, well, uh, I think uh, I think that I need to worry about prepping a little bit more. But I would rather this channel not exist than actually go through that. So it is what it is, right? We don't want any of these things to happen. But we have to be realistic about their possibility. And we have to prepare for them as if they are going to happen so that if they do, there's no issues, right? And if they don't happen... We're better off in the sense of having that insurance in case anything else ever does, right? And then I know a lot of people say like, oh, you know, there's so many limited uses of like a gas mask and stuff like that, right? A CBRN protection. And that's true. But who knows? You never know what situation might arise. There could be uh, an airborne pathogen at some point in time, right? We could also see ourselves dealing with unrest where things like tear gas and stuff are being used. I don't know. In Terminator 2, it seemed like gas masks were pretty handy. So I was throwing it out there. Like there's a lot of things that... We shouldn't write off just because they're not happening in the immediate, right? Now, uh, Savage Lee, I could have been a simple gun tuber. You know, I, I know I dabble in that in that realm from time to time, but uh, I, I try to be more broad than that. And I know that actually hurts my my growth here on this platform. To be completely honest with you, because I know there's people here in this chat right now who are like, I don't watch any of your gun stuff because I don't care about that. And I totally get that, and I don't blame anybody for being that way. And then I know people who watch my gun stuff that are like, what is this dude talking about? Great Depression? Get out of here. Right? So it's it's a it's a balance that I try to find, and it's a difficult one to, to, to try to figure out. Um, but, you know, hopefully it makes sense for everybody, because, like, in all honesty, the very first video I ever posted on this channel had a gun in it. So I'm doing what I can here, right? Um, but there are a lot of things I need to learn, and there's a lot of skills that I need to perpetuate and uh, become proficient at so that I can share them with the community. And there's some stuff I'm working on now to better my homestead and start moving that towards being productive so that way I can share those concepts and ideas with the community. Um, and my, I guess, you know, I guess I would say right now one of my goals is to work with experts in their field. And I don't mean like, I, I, I'll be honest, guys, I don't have Canadian prepper uh, status to where I can access some of these really in intellectual experts in their field right like like those people are not necessarily always trying to come talk to me because i'm this weird fringe guy that's got a gadsden flag in the background might be one of those you know what i mean <laughs> but what i will say is that um i'm talking about i'm talking about experts who know what they're talking about like at least for what applies to what i'm trying to accomplish so uh for example tomorrow i'm gonna go talk to one of my neighbors who knows a lot about farming and everything else related to what we do here in our area he's offered some help when it comes to 
planning for my property and trying to put things together so that it can be more productive. Um, and that's what I'm going to go do. And then hopefully I can share that information, right? Uh, very similar to working with Chappie over at Nightline, okay? Um, so I don't know if you know who Chappie is, but he is my contact at Nightline Inc. Very cool guy, very storied history, has a lot of experience and a lot of things that I have no experience in at all whatsoever. And I reference him all the time and he's probably, you know, got my phone number on like some kind of like don't answer situation at this point because I'm always calling him to ask what seemingly could be basic questions for somebody of his expertise level. But I'm not going to pretend I'm something I'm not. So I'm calling him saying, hey, how does this work? How do I make sure that this makes sense for you know, sharing this information with my community. Because if I'm going to talk about things like night vision, I don't want to give out bad information or give anyone any ideas that don't make sense or expectations that like, that can't be met, right? And so we have good conversations. I learn from that and then I move forward. So I'm trying my best to rely on those people to help push me further in my preparedness, but also give me the knowledge that they have so that I can provide better information here. Um, so that's what I'm doing. I hope that all makes sense to everybody, you know, doing, doing what I can. Um, Man, and and still balancing life too, because you know, like I, I you know I am very active with my kids. I, I take them to school. I make sure they have you know what they need. I try to be involved with their lives, you know. So so I have to spend that that family time as well, because like I want to make sure that they have a good life. Um, so there's a balance, and it's it's a tough one to get sometimes. But I appreciate all of you allowing me to find that balance because having the patience with me to say, okay, magic. Um, I guess you, you you did that, but maybe that's not the best idea, right? Well. I learned very quickly, hey, that's not the best idea. And now I know I'm not probably going to do that idea anymore, right? So I appreciate all of you as well. Now, let me make sure. Um, um, Kevin Grip, good night vision, come to conclusion, got to spend 2500 or more. Yeah, probably. Um, if you guys don't know, though, Nightline Inc., super cool company. They used to basically only sell to, like, the professionals, let's just say. Um, and now they're selling to the civilian populace because they actually believe in the preparedness sense that we're going to need some of this equipment. And it's, it's honestly a lot more about that than it is, uh, trying to make a profit or sales or anything like that. They, uh, have a genuine concern for what's happening to our country. So, which I appreciate. And at the same time, um, they don't need the extra sales. I can tell you that right now, based on <laughs> what they do in the sense of production. So, Here's the thing. Uh, if you go to Nightline Inc., if you search them and go to their website or whatever, uh, if you do end up going through the process of buying something from them, all you got to mention is that Magic Prepper sent you and you'll get 15% off, which you're still going to spend a crap load of money because that equipment is not inexpensive. But 15% off something that's very expensive is a lot of money saved. So just keep that in mind because uh, maybe it helps you out if that's something you're interested in. And they do have some of those, um, like they have like basically PVS 14s that are within that 2,500 range uh, and that 15% off can really help you get into that kind of ballpark. So, um, but look, it's, it's an expensive game and, uh, I am very, you know, thankful to Nightline for working with me to try to, you know, allow me to bridge into some of that because a lot of this stuff I couldn't do on my own. So I really appreciate it. And all of you really make it worth doing. So, um, and Chris Hollingsworth, you could save 15% by switching to Geico. That's true. Although I'll say personally that that's not been my experience. And in fact, even when I have, <laughs> even when I've literally told them I got a quote from like Progressive for way less money, they're like, oh, well, sorry, we can't. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'm just going to pay someone else, you know. Not to mention, uh, uh, you know, I think they, they raised my rate one time because I reported something that never actually ended up costing anything. And they raised my rate anyway. Uh, it was like, hey, this incident happened and I'm just letting you know, but I don't know if the other party involved is going to like even mention it, right? And they're like, okay, thanks for letting us know. And then the next month they're like, yeah, well, your insurance went up $50 a month because you told us that you, you had something happen that day. And I'm like, yeah, but like nothing came of it and you guys didn't spend any money and no one got hurt or anything. And like there's like no money was spent. And they're like, yeah, but you know, you're up 50 bucks a month now. And I'm like, cool. <laughs> okay so i don't have geico anymore now i don't know why we're talking about that anyway listen make sure you prepare for these nuclear events seriously and if you're near one of these nuclear uh facilities i would plan accordingly because it is true that they can literally uh become a a weapon at some point in time in all honesty okay so i'm just going to share this map again just so everybody can see it because i know a lot of people are asking about it here it is, okay? So you can see you have one in Washington, one in California, one in Arizona, a ton on the East Coast. So if you're on the East Coast, be aware, like, you're 
You're, it's all over the place. Um, and then, you know, coming up from Texas, as you can see, where that one is, right near where that nuclear drill is going on right this second. And which is kind of what spawned this whole conversation to say they're doing these drills. I wonder, like, if there's any other things to consider when we're talking about these exercises. And then I'm reading all these articles about how Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in Ukraine is being weaponized and being hardened and all these things. And then I'm like, you know, it's really interesting that you don't hear a lot about that here in the United States, yet they're doing drills and preparing for these things here and in South Korea. Maybe there's something more to this than what we uh, have been told. So um, hopefully that gave you something to think about. I will go ahead and share this in the chat once again, just so everybody has it. Okay, so that is the map right there, which you can get to the list of the units from. Uh, but I will also, why is it trying to share radioactive waste with me now? Look, I don't make these websites, you know, this is government stuff. They're, they're not always the best at this stuff. But I also have the list right here for you as well. Um, Squirrel Q, uh, what's the yellow? Or just Squirrel asking what's the yellow? The yellow is the region of those power plants. So um, they have different regions that they kind of organize them all by. And so I believe yellow region, uh, I'm not sure what region it is, but it's just a number that's associated with it. So it looks like yellow was in like Michigan and stuff, right? So if I find a Michigan plant on here somewhere, here's Wisconsin, it's region three, right? So I think that's just what the yellow dictates, all right? But you got the list now, so that can give you that information. And uh, look, you know, my whole goal here was just to make everyone aware of that possibility. And the fact that Russia is currently involved in that type of a strategic plan for these nuclear plants, well... There's no reason not to assume that could happen here as well, okay? So, thank you all so much for being here. We're at the hour mark. I think we're going to call it a night. If you have anything else you need from me, magicprepper.com is always a good place to go. I know Exile Review shared the Discord earlier. If you want to come in and try to meet some other people in your area, we have different channels for each state as well as country. If you're brave and you want to see what's going on in some of the general chats and the meme chat and everything else, then do so at your own risk because... Uh, you know, First Amendment for the most part, but obviously Discord has its rules as well. So we do our best, but it gets a little crazy in there. Uh, T. Fisher, well, thank you so much. I appreciate you as well. And I hope you all know, um, I like I gen genuinely appreciate you. Like, I really do. So, uh, and that's the reason why I do these live streams. Because I feel like it gives us a little bit more of like a personal conversation in the community and it feels like we can kind of connect a little bit more than just you know produced videos so if there's anything else you need from me magicprepper.com always a good place to go and besides that that's going to be it for magic prepper